Hello and welcome uh, to another episode of Fully Charged News, the first episode of 2021. So I just want to take this brief opportunity to say Happy New Year to all our wonderful viewers, supporters and people who just stumble across this show out of the blue and wonder what on earth is going on. So we are planning on doing a hell of a lot of shows this year. We're still hoping against hope that we'll be able to run our two live events, uh, the Fully Charged Live outside in uh, late June at, at Farnborough and Fully Charged Live Amsterdam in September, October uh, for Fully Charged Europe this year, 2021. Hoping, fingers crossed, that this is going to be possible. It's looking almost hopeful. But I thought it would be a good idea to try and do some updates uh, uh, that are basically fairly positive bits of news. Because if you want negative news, and who would, there is ample buckets of it being pumped out by every uh, single mainstream media outlet 24-7. Newspapers, television, radio, just chundering gobloads of hyper-negative, depressing news. It's real. It's not like we should avoid it. We need to know what's going on. But this show will have a little bit of positive news balanced with a little bit of reality. I think we can all agree now the world has changed beyond all recognition and we really need to make sure it doesn't go back to exactly how it was before all this started. We really need to take advantage of this time to reflect and consider what is important and what really isn't. How important is it to own lots of stuff? Probably less important than we thought. How important is it to be able to see and be with your friends? Very, very important. You know, just to be able to give someone a hug. I am definitely missing hugs. My missus gets a lot of hugs from me now. I think she's had enough. But there are lots of reasons to be positive. And here's an interesting one. Apple, you know, the computery, phony people. That doesn't sound right, does it, when you say phony? <laughs> the realistic computer and phone people. A few years ago, they were talking about making the Apple car. It was a big topic. Loads of people were speculating what the Apple car would look like. I mean, they make computers and phones. They know all about computers and phones and batteries. So they were going to make a car. And there was a man called Doug Field who left Tesla. He was one of the real big high up dudes at Tesla. He left Tesla and joined Apple to start what was then called Project Titan. But it all went a bit wibbly wobbly in 2019. I have no idea quite why, but I know that Apple laid off about 190 people who were working on Project Titan and it all went very, very quiet. A bit like Dyson in this country. Huge amounts of speculation and waffle about Dyson and the Dyson car and it's going to be amazing and everything. And I actually met an engineer who was working on the Dyson car and he was a little bit inebriated told me probably rather more than he should have done. And then about a month later, when I thought, God, I've got a scoop here, the whole project was canned. They showed the, the Dyson car. It was a massive, yet another massive fat SUV. They never made it. It was all a load of waffle. So now suddenly Apple is back in the news. There's a whole new raft of speculation and theories and rumors about Apple starting to produce an electric car. Now, I'm not going to hold my breath but I can see the logic of it. I mean, they have exploited, they are such a wealthy company. They're, they're basically, historically, there's never been a company with more money. So they have the money to spend, to develop, to make an electric car. Whether they'll make it on their own, I think is kind of doubtful. I think if they've got any sense, they'll work with an existing automaker who knows how to manufacture cars. If you look at the pain that Tesla have been through in the last 10 or 11 years, getting into a position where they can mass manufacture cars, they've done it. And they're doing incredibly well and they're way ahead of the pack. The only people I think that can realistically compete with someone like Tesla is either a Chinese company with vast amounts of investment or someone like Apple. All the existing car makers, it's going to be a real struggle for them. And if someone like Apple comes in with literally billions and billions of dollars to put into manufacturing drivetrains, battery systems, new battery technology, the software that manages that, the software that helps manage the car, the autonomous driving software, that's the sort of company that's going to be able to do that. Not the existing car makers. They haven't got a clue. They've got to have a third party that comes in to help them. With They know how to make valves, pistons, crankshafts, gearboxes, clutches. What use are they? And here's a story that perfectly illustrates the pain the traditional automaking industry is going through. Volkswagen. Oh my God, that car, the, the ID3, is, is just amazing. My neighbour's got one. She absolutely loves it. 
no argument. Volkswagen have made a brilliant, small, hatchback electric car. It's just fantastic. So you'd think that the Volkswagen dealership network around the world would be pushing this like crazy, desperate to try and shift as many VW ID3s as they possibly could. And uh, Greenpeace in Germany uh, recently sent out some secret shoppers uh, around the uh, Volkswagen dealerships in Germany, uh, posing as absolutely the perfect customer. People who've got the budget to buy the car, who are interested in buying the car, who clearly explain they have a garage or off-street parking where they can charge the car, that their daily commute is well within the car's range. All those things. And they go around, they went around 50 Volkswagen dealerships and 27 out of those 50 tried to flog them a combustion engine Volkswagen. There's a huge problem for the existing motor manufacturing industry, even if the company making the cars is passionately committed, which we will see in the next story, passionately committed to doing so, like Volkswagen, they've still got this massive dead weight of dealerships and dealership networks that are resisting as hard as they can. And why? Why is that? We've talked about it endlessly on this show. How does a dealership make money out of an electric car? They sell it, you know, screen wash, and uh, they look under the bonnet, they might do air conditioning, they might do a little bit of check on the air conditioning, check the tyres, brakes, steering, all the lights, nothing, there's nothing to do. If that was a combustion car, huge amount of really expensive spare parts that that car needs, because combustion engines <laughs> are pathetically rubbish. That's the problem. And if, if you've got a pathetically rubbish product that constantly needs replacement parts and servicing and careful management of how it's done, then you can make money out of it. You can flog a combustion car for five quid and still make money out of it because every year the poor sucker that's bought it, and I am one of them. I've had, I have spent hundreds of thousands of pounds in my life servicing combustion cars. Do you know how much I've spent servicing electric cars? probably 250 quid in the last 10 years that is the difference i mean it's boring but it's true and actually what's really upsetting with this is the actual leadership at volkswagen are really really keen to really transition the entire company to electric ground transport now there was recently a lot of hoo-ha diddly-boo in the boardroom of volkswagen i don't even know how this stuff works but there was some resistance to this there was a lot of people clearly in the sort of management level and executive level of Volkswagen, who wanted to carry on making combustion engines because they are the, they are proper engines for a proper car, you know. And their boss, uh, what's his name, Dees, uh, Herbert Dees, what a dude. He said, no, we're going to go fully 100% electric, and if you don't want that, get rid of me. And they had a vote, and he won. So that is good news. And here's some more good news with a little caveat of reality, but it is really good news. It's been accepted in automotive circles for the last 10 to 15 years that once battery manufacturing costs, not cell costs, but the pack manufacturing costs, fall below $100 per kilowatt hour of energy storage, then that's the tipping point. That means that you will be able to buy a brand new electric car for the same as or indeed less than a petrol or diesel model. Well, Bloomberg New Energy Finance have just announced that the first $100 per kilowatt hour battery has been sold in China, but it's still $100 per kilowatt hour pack cost. That is incredible that that's happened and that's happened this quickly. Now, this is a specific battery design that's specifically for buses. And what's exciting about that for us is we've got this incredible report that Elliot Richards has done for us about the buses in Shenzhen in China and how on earth you charge. I think it's 20,000 or 21,000 buses every night in Shenzhen, which they do. Uh, and he's been to the been to Shenzhen, got permission from the government to film what they do and how they how they maintain these buses. But just to put this battery cost thing in perspective, and I may have mentioned this many times before, and if so, I apologise. But I, all I know is when I bought my Nissan Leaf, the original Nissan Leaf, uh, with a 24 kilowatt hour battery, back it was built in 2010. In 2010, uh, the cost of a battery pack was about one thousand one hundred, one thousand two hundred dollars. 
per kilowatt hour, the manufacturing cost to make that battery. Very, very expensive. It's dropped by 83% in the last 10 years. And so now the cost of a battery pack in a new Tesla Model 3 is around about $130 a kilowatt hour. So it's gone from 1,200 roughly around there, 1,100, 1,200 to 130. And now in these buses, 100. Now all the indications, all the projections, all the manufacturers, the mining companies, the minerals extraction companies, the battery manufacturers, the pack manufacturers, the car companies, all predict that by 2023, the average battery cost will be $100 a kilowatt hour or less. It basically means that by 2023, the cost of a new electric car will be the same as the cost of a new petrol or diesel car. There's, there'll be no excuse. Why would you buy a petrol or diesel car then? I mean, I have to ask the question, why would you buy a new car ever? It seems like an insane expense, but people do. But you wouldn't, you know, the lease cost on a, a new electric car will be the same as the lease cost on a new petrol car, probably less. But the thing is, regardless of anything else, and regardless even of uh, road pricing or other taxes that governments around the world might put on electric cars are going to have to pay to use the roads. Currently, I don't pay to use the roads and I drive electric cars on them. That is not fair. That will come to an end. But even with that, the cost of the fuel is so much less. The fact that you can, it's not always easy, it's not suitable, not uh, easily accessible to everyone, but you can produce your own fuel. That makes a big difference. And the, the, the cost of servicing and maintaining those vehicles, regardless of other taxes, is so much lower. And I think the fact that there are $100 per kilowatt hour pack prices for buses is actually really important. We need a massive investment in public transport, in last mile delivery, in trucks, in everything. All the vehicle, any vehicle that goes into a city just has to be electric in the next four or five years. It's really wrong to make people who live in cities who don't own private cars very lightly, if they live in inner cities, to have to breathe in the filthy, toxic stink that people who live in the suburbs pump out into the air. It is a disgrace. I'm doing another ranting story on Fully Charged Plus about tailpipe emissions and the reality of tailpipe emissions. I'm not gonna do it on here. I'm gonna stop right now because everything on this channel has got to be lovely. And here's a brilliant example of why it makes sense to have electric buses if you're a bus company. White Plains in New York State. Uh, I've actually spent time around there. I have some very good friends that live in that area and their kids went to school on American school buses in the United States. A classic yellow American school bus. Well, there's five of them run by the White Plains School Board. In, this is in New York State, uh, who, that are 100% electric. And what do they do with them? They charge them up at night. They drive the kids to school in the morning. Then they go back to the depot. Then they sit at the depot all day. This is what a diesel bus would do. Sits at the depot all day doing nothing. Just sitting there doing nothing. And then, I don't know what time, 3.30, 4 o'clock, they all go and they pick up the kids and take them all back home. And then they come back to the depot where they sit there all night. Those buses are used probably three or four hours a day. There's 850,000 of those buses on the roads of the United States. They're all diesel. They're all a massive waste of investment. What these five buses are doing, they're all plugged in to vehicle to grid systems. So while they're not being used, which is the vast majority of their working life, they are being, the batteries are helping balance the local grid. Now, I am the first person to point out with some fury that five buses don't make a hell of a lot of difference in the grand scheme of things. But in the local scheme of things, they make a big difference. They're helping to balance the local grid. If there were 50 buses, it would make a big difference. If there were 5,000 buses, it would start to really make an impact and people in the local grid control offices would see reductions in use at peak times and increases in use at low times when energy is cheaper. And if there were let's say 850,000 electric buses all across America that were all plugged into vehicle to grid chargers when they weren't running, you've really got the equivalent of a couple of very large nuclear power stations at your beck and call should you need the energy for a while. And now a quick skip through some other stories that have caught my eye. First of all, this book is really remarkable. The Blind Guardians of Ignorance by Mats Larsson it has only just come out. Uh, he's a Swedish writer. I uh, haven't finished it. I'm reading at the moment, but he's going to be a guest on the Fully Charged Show podcast very soon. And I, it's a thing that often I forget to mention on the Fully Charged Show is that we do a, a weekly podcast. We've been doing it for over two years. Uh, it's got, I don't know how many millions of downloads. It's doing all right. 
it is doing all right and it's very different to the show because obviously it's audio uh but it, it i get lots of different people on and matt larson is going to come on and that is a fascinating book uh it's called covid19 sustainability and our vulnerable future it's about what we could do in the future that might just be better than what we did in the past a handbook for change leaders young and old uh and it's quite challenging it's quite challenging it's not like straightforward you know let's all hug a tree and be lovely uh, some very tough things that he talks about in there. Very, very interesting. Not altogether flattering about the Swedish administ- the current Swedish administration. So uh, really interesting. So if you haven't heard the Fully Charged Show podcast, uh, have a look for that. It's called the Fully Charged Show podcast. Available on all your podcast downloading apps and on Fully Charged Plus on YouTube. Anyway, very interesting book. Really looking forward to speaking to Matt's. I'm going to carry on reading it. It's been really good lockdown reading. Toyota, amazing car company. Uh, what they did with the Prius a few decades ago, absolutely stunning. The hybrid drivetrain they developed was flawless, brilliant. I had two Priuses and they were brilliant cars of their era. A little bit dated now, but still, nonetheless, had a massive impact on the automotive industry and I would take my hat off to them. They then very much steered towards hydrogen fuel cell cars. I've driven the Toyota Mirai, fantastic car, really, really nice car, much longer range than a battery car. And then you can fill it really quickly if you can use one of the three or four hydrogen fuel filling stations in the UK. They're just, and one of them is, I know has been broken for many, many, possibly years now, certainly many months. And that's from talking to people who use hydrogen fuel cell cars in London, taxis, and they can't refill them. It's a, it's a problem. That's a whole other issue. But Toyota, who've been very, very critical of battery electric vehicles, their boss man, whose name is Akio Toyoda, he doesn't uh, think that's the case. But the pressure now on that company must be so colossal when they look around and see what everyone else is doing and they're not doing it they do sell 100 percent electric cars in china and they're doing very well and they are about to launch uh, a tiny little electric car in um, really in just in japan to start with and mainly for government it's like it's very much like the citroen ami that i drove recently i think those cars really have a role this this one goes a bit faster and has a slightly longer range but it is minuscule and super small uh, two-seater urban car they are bringing out a new fully electric vehicle uh, i think that this year or early next year um we haven't seen it yet we don't know much about it but that you know so they're clearly going to be making battery electric vehicles in the next couple of years and while i'm on the topic of hydrogen uh, i just want to point out these amazing articles i really think they're worth reading if you've got the moment uh, which many of us have quite a lot of moments at the moment. Uh, Michael Liebrich, uh, who's been a guest on the Fully Charged Show podcast, and I hope to get him back again, has written a very, very thoughtful, interesting piece on uh, uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance about hydrogen. It's too complex for me to go into it. It really analyzes it very carefully. I'll put all the links to all these articles in the uh, description box beneath this video. What else is there? Oh, yes, on the subject of hydrogen. is a perfect example. I forgot about this. Airbus, Airbus Industries are developing hydrogen fuel cell propulsion pods that they can sling under the wings of aircraft. This is such, with the tank, everything is in the pod. The fuel tank, the hydrogen fuel cell, and the motor, which spins the propeller. I mean, it's just, what I find really exciting, okay, this is what makes me bother to get up in the morning and make episodes of Fully Charged, is this kind of stuff, where completely bonkers off the wall ideas start to become plausible airbus are doing amazing research and amazing stuff we're not going to see this in the next five years but we might see in the next 10 we'll start to see aircraft that can fly without burning fuel and won't that be amazing what a brilliant use of hydrogen fuel cell technology and we're really hoping to make more shows about non-combustion uh, aircraft this year there's one we're going to go and see we've been we, we, we had it booked up four times in a row last year and every time there was a lockdown or there was an increase or that we went into the wrong tier or we couldn't do it and so we haven't been able to do it last year but this year 2021 we're going to film some electric aircraft if it's the last thing i do which of course it might be finally rolls royce now (coughs) it's important to remember uh, and to remind ourselves whenever we talk about rolls royce that i always think of the cars obviously but i actually now do think of the aero engines they you know they are big aero engine manufacturers a lot of the planes that you fly in will have rolls royce engines no i'll rephrase that a lot of the planes that you flew in will have had rolls royce engines um <coughs> but they also make power plants for submarines when i say that it's not like 
a diesel engine or something it's a nuclear power plant they make small modular nuclear power plants that have proven themselves to be very very reliable and safe because they're underwater with loads of people around them and they haven't exploded and killed everyone so that's a good thing so they are planning on building 16 smrs to uh, install around the uk what you may ask is an smr sir the smr is completely operational and all systems are functioning perfectly it is a small modular reactor it's basically the same technology that's used in a submarine it's compressed right down in a submarine it'll be expanded a bit to be a power plant now the objective of smrs is to tackle the really i think the biggest challenge that the nuclear industry has which is the eye-watering gobsmacking cost of building nuclear power plants the whole point of this <coughs> is these power plants will be built in a factory effectively mass produced and therefore cheaper and then they'll be shipped in small units to where they're being installed and uh, you know they you know they're, they're each of them they're not like massive things they're nothing like as big as like the big power plants that are being built here at the moment hinkley point c you know is a, is a three gigawatt um power plant these are 440 megawatts so much smaller but they still cost about two billion pounds each we've got to accept that once these uh, systems are up and running they run 24 7 they they're very very efficient they are they produce no co2 uh they produce some nuclear waste that's a little bit awkward you know don't want to talk about that just ignore it just pretend it's not there and bury it uh, anyway that's anyway Anyway, on that very cheerful note, I'd just like to quickly take this opportunity to thank a few of our fantastic Patreon supporters who continue to support this show day and night, 24-7, 365, uh, where, where, to the amount of $10 a month or more in some cases. Absolutely, incredibly generous and patient and kind and just amazing. So thank you very much to the following people. Tim Maxey, Claire van der Ark. David Gwyn Jones, Stubbs, Stephen Bush, James Kerrigan, Simon Olowix, Lauren Hahn, David Martin, Sam Casey, David Foy, Michael DeBacker, Peter Gorton, John Paul Breen, Christine Anisato Ishi, Demian Gass, Joseph Regner, Daniel Felt, and Orlin Radev. Thank you so much for your support. We really, really appreciate it. And we wouldn't be here without it. No question. Don't have to make that up. That is the truth. That's all. Don't want to go on anymore. Do the normal things, please. Subscribe. The bing, the bell. The look at the Patreon links beneath it. All that stuff. And um, we'll see you a lot this year in all the shows that we're doing fully charged really looking forward to it take care look after yourself and as always if you have been thank you for watching